Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming or virtually coming. Uh, I'm sad to, that Shen has to do it over Zoom, but I'm very happy that we've gotten to the day where she's, Shen is defending her thesis here today. Um, I met Shen first when she took uh, my robotics class. And I remember she found all kinds of errors in my notes and, uh, you know, and, was, and, and the speed and accuracy with which she was correcting me made me think she'd be a pretty darn good student to have in lab. <laughs> so, um, and she's done a bunch of cool things. Uh, you know, the, the hardest problem we've been trying to tackle is, is trying to verify recurrent neural networks in the same kind of way people have verified uh, uh, feed forward networks. And she'll tell you a little bit about that today. But also in the process of doing that and trying to make it scale, she made a connection I'm in, in very excited about, you're gonna hear about, which maybe I can tell you the background is that, um, We've been using sums of squares optimization to verify the performance of our robots. For our simple robots, it's worked very well. We've gotten up to quad rotors and things like this, but for very more complicated robots, we always had a scaling issue. And there's, it, it's always bugged me because there's an obvi some obvious idea of, of how to improve it, which is that we're writing our sums of squares problems on, uh, a, on a set of inequalities, a semi-algebraic set or an algebraic set even, that is described by the equations of motion of my robot. And there's tons of structure there and we've never been able to exploit it. And I've lost, you know, we had for a while where every summer we'd had some talented student come in and want to spend the summer and we'd ask them to try to find a Grobner basis for, the, for our robot. And it never scaled and it never worked. And Shen, in her last um, push here, found some results from Pablo and, and Diego and, show, and realized that that would actually address this, this hardness problem that we've been struggling with for years and years and years. So she's made a, a very exciting advance, in my opinion, about making, you know, improving our ability to do sums of squares verification on bigger, more complicated robots. And I'm happy to have Shen tell you that story and some of the recurrent network story today. Shen, take it away. Thanks, Rush, uh, for the very nice introduction. Uh, it'll be hard to live up to the nice words, but uh, uh, let me try. Um, so the title of my talk is uh, Scalable Verification of Robots and Recurrent Neural Networks. Um, so the outline is obviously um, just going to be verification for robots and verification for RN. Um, let's start with robots. Um, this is quite an exciting time uh, for robotics. Uh, even if you are not in the field, you probably have seen a lot of this exciting new advancement in the field um, over uh, either in the news or uh, on YouTube. Uh, as Russ sort of implied, I, I first joined the lab when I took his class, but even before that, I started learning about robotics on YouTube too. But instead of seeing those successes, the one that I saw is actually uh, coming from the DARPA Robotics Challenge for which Russ was the team leader and MIT team did pretty well. But the video I saw was this. Um, so at that time it was pretty funny and intriguing, but after joining the group, uh, I learned that that failure case actually revealed some uh, fundamental challenges uh, in particular, uh, it's not because we don't care about safety or uh, reliance. It's more about we have the right tools, as Russ said, but uh, there are some fundamental challenges in scaling them up. Uh, so showing here is uh, a, a work done by Ani, our uh, former lab mate, who um, showed that um, the UAV can uh, sort of uh, very dynamically uh, pass through this unknown environment, uh, collision free and also withstand some disturbances. So the method he used uh, was um, sort of very relevant here. So let me uh, try to, uh, at least at a high level, uh, summarize it. Um, you compute, uh, so there are some uh, white ellipsoid that you see, and those are the so-called funnels that he pre-computes, such that it's guaranteed that anything that starts from the inlet of the funnel uh, throughout the execution of the trajectory would still remain in the funnel and thereby guarantee safety. Um, so it would have been the most ideal if we can carry over the same type of uh, formal guarantee, uh, not only provable, but also demonstrated on hardware. We can carry those over to Atlas, but um, the scalability has been a major sort of um, uh, a th uh, major um, a challenge along the way uh, of that uh, transition. Uh, in particular here, the demonstration is shown uh, um, 
for a 12 states um, uh, UAV, and it's uh, almost at the limit of those uh, summer squares based verification or control uh, uh, tools. And um, that scale is just not nearly enough for robots like Atlas. So the major motivation is really how do we uh, actually improve the scalability of the very fundamental um, sum of squares based verification and control. So the first idea I tried is actually uh, pretty simple. Uh, is a compositional verification. Um, the motivation for that idea is really, oh, eventually we want to study big systems. Solar system seems to be pretty big and we can uh, reasonably assume that you know, the sun and, uh, and earth pair dynamics, so we probably can reasonably just learn that uh, or study that without caring about planets that's far, far away. So even though uh, gravity force, uh, gravitational force are universal, um, it's safe to assume that uh, that distance would result in uh, a force that's pretty small and we can somehow bound it or somehow ignore it and still say something about the whole system by just looking at the parts. Um, the, the same uh, si situation happens in mechanical systems too. Uh, for example, a spring, dam a spring mass system, if your mass is pretty big uh, and spring pretty weak. So it's both uh, plausible to study this uh, whole system by parts, but it's also desirable for obvious reasons. We would be studying uh, smaller systems instead of the big one. So how do we actually stud even, study even small systems? So let me give you a canonical example. Uh, uh, some of you might be too familiar with this, but bear with me for a moment. Um, so this is um, a two-dimensional um, time-reversed Van der Poel oscillator uh, governed by this uh, ordinary differential equation. The red curve sort of encircles what is known as the region of, attra the region of attraction. So it describes as a, a, a set of states from which if you follow the, the arrows, which is the, uh, the dynamics of, of flow, you would end up at the origin, which is uh, 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 the notion of stability. So region of attraction might seem to be a very uh, theoretical concept, might be very abstract, but in fact, you've seen a version of it already. So in Ani's work, the funnel that he computed that eventually guaranteed the safety of his flight is really uh, just time sequenced composition of basically region of attractions. So it does have very practical usage and it's very important uh, that we understand region of attraction. And sort of hidden in this example is that region of attraction, most of the time, uh, it's not only unknown, but it's also very hard to actually compute that exactly. And oftentimes what people do is uh, approximate the region of attraction, which would be a major problem that we try to address as sort of the stepping stone to understand uh, bigger problems. So let me set up uh, the region of attraction analysis, uh, the, the um, standard way at least first. Um, so the analysis for that is usually based on Lyapunov analysis, where uh, Lyapunov function is a scalar function of the state uh, positive definite, so that uh, if you have a state where the derivative of the of the Lyapunov value is going downhill, then you know eventually you will end up at the uh, origin, thereby proving your st you are stable. So oftentimes we care about local stability, and uh, the local the locality of it is oftentimes uh, parameterized by a level field of a, of a Lyapunov function. So shown here in the animation, the top part is a Lyapunov function value. The bottom part, the, uh, the bottom uh, greenish part is the V dot uh, value. So as you can see, as I move further away from the origin, uh, my Lyapunov value evaluation is gonna grow. So by uh, sort of uh, manipulating this row value, I have a way of um, optimize for uh, the volume of the uh, region of attraction approximation. And um, so we have this theoretical foundation and how do we actually uh, put that in a computer to try to help us uh, do the verification. And that's really based on uh, the work that's um, sort of uh, made popular by, uh, by Pablo. Um, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's by checking the non-negativity condition for a limited family of uh, functions, the polynomials to be exact. Um, 
But as it turns out, checking the negativity of polynomial is MP hard in general, but um, you can check a sufficient condition for it uh, using uh, semi-definite programs. In particular, if your polynomials, uh, if your polynomial function, uh, capital F here, can be written as a sum of squares of polynomials, then it's sufficient that it's a um, non-negative polynomial. And there's a way, a systematic way, to translate that condition into a sort of product uh, uh, factorization where you have M transpose uh, times Q times M, where the M is what's called a monomial basis, um, Q what we call a grand matrix, and that condition of requiring the polynomial to be non-negative is really just a, a condition that translates into requiring the grand matrix to be positive semi-definite. So the nice thing about this procedure is, for one, it's a systematic. Um, it not only can check the um, non-negativity, but it can also search for parameters for it. Uh, the not so nice thing about it is uh, the size of the monomial basis grows with the number of your um, decision, uh, with the number of the variables, as well as with respect to the degree of your polynomial. For example, if my f here is not a function of x1 and x2, but a function of x3 as well, so with an extra x3 squared term in the polynomial, then for sure I would have to include an x3 in my monomial basis to account for that additional term. Uh, and, and in fact, that growth is actually pretty um, uh, rapid. Uh, it grows binomially uh, in terms of the number of uh, variables and uh, the degree. So our intuition of breaking that big, big system uh, into smaller parts can really pay off in this situation because eventually we will be solving smaller SDPs because we are dealing with a smaller uh, number of variables. And um, Ultimately, we did achieve that independent analysis that we set out for uh, by borrowing ideas from actually uh, robust control. Um, because our ultimate goal is to analyze systems by parts independently, it's almost as if saying, well, this big system is stable with or without that weak coupling term that we sort of assumed are there. So this way of thinking can uh, lead us to treating the internal or sort of coupling dynamics as uh, dynamic disturbances. And by borrowing ideas from robust control, we uh, uh, sort of um, uh, develop various uh, ways of bounding that coupling and was able to eventually uh, totally uh, break up uh, the system. For example, here, uh, you, if you would have uh, solved a five by five uh, SDP using our procedure in the best case scenario, you could have solved five one by one SDP. So that's the high idea. Um, I won't get into the details of the experimental detail or, or, or the proofs that went through, but uh, let me just say um, a few words about like, what we liked about this work. Uh, so we did um, achieve an improved scalability when compared with uh, direct optimization, and we did achieve uh, orders of magnitude um, in improvement over existing compositional methods, and we also uh, assumed less uh, special structures such as a cyclic or triangular structure in the system. So that's the good news. But as soon as we sort of try to extend this to uh, more general systems, we hit a wall. Um, because implicitly, the whole idea is built on the notion of weak coupling. And that's just not realistic. For example, here, this is an um, uh, uh, unlinked pendulum on a cart. It's obviously very much dynamically coupled. Everything that moves on the pendulum is going to affect anything, any link um, on the other side. So, this not general, uh, this non general, um, this uh, sort of limitation is a structural. But also, uh, our solutions are based on this bounding technique such that it's conservative. Um, to be fair, though, it's not an unusual uh, drawback for a scale improving techniques. It's oftentimes a sacrificing some quality to, uh, to get some uh, a speed improvement. But the major sort of the part that I am most unhappy about is uh, this method is just not fundamental. The more I learn about some of Square's techniques and the way that it's used in verification, I realized SDP is not even uh, not only not the only issue, but maybe not even the major issue. Um, in some sense, it's a scapegoat of very inefficient high-level problem formulation. So that leads to um, the major part of this talk, uh, sampling quotient ring sum of squares. 
Um, so um, I mentioned that SDP being a scapegoat. So let me try to uh, sort of say it in more detail to justify it. Let's take a closer look at the verification pipeline, what's going on inside a standard pipeline. So we, we uh, started out with some of the optimal condition, which we saw earlier, there's, a sum, there's some sign conditions on the function. We massage that into a sum of squares condition. So we say, okay, this function being non-negative, we just uh, sufficiently require it to be a sum of squares. And then through that monomial basis embedding, that M term that you just saw earlier, we require a SDP condition on the gram matrix. So the SDP is at the final step. And we, we talked about how that could be a sort of um, a, a, a computational overhead. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, all the way through this pipeline, there's overheads everywhere. Um, so there's um, the, the first two parts, uh, I will describe it in detail later on, um, but it's, uh, let me just uh, sort of uh, put it in your head. So, so the way that we encode those Lyapunov conditions, it's usually a very complicated inequality or equality based SAT implication. The way that we write those SAS programs is oftentimes um, dependent on the use of multipliers uh, for the sake of making problems of polynomial and convex. And then the bi binomial growth and unstructured SDP at the end also brings in some computational overhead. So the existing scale improving methods, much like our own work early on, uh, sort of addresses only the, the lower level situation, only addresses the, the, the low level uh, computational overhead. And it also suffers from the same uh, drawback that I just mentioned. It's not general. Uh, it, it oftentimes assumes uh, uh, some sort of structuring the problem to, to solve the pro uh, to, 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 to offer um, computational improvement. And it also is often at the uh, cost of bringing uh, conservatism or uh, bringing the loss of accuracy into the problem. Uh, whereas uh, the higher level um, uh, problem reformulation, there's almost none uh, existing work that, I, that we know of uh, that addresses that overhead. And we will talk about uh, that in detail later on, uh, but to uh, sort of a nice flow to sort of bring our work into the picture uh, is what we propose is a, a combination of uh, new formulations that addresses the first two blocks of overheads and the application of a general sampling of variety approach that Diego and Pablo developed not long ago. We apply that method to address some of the more uh, computationally natured uh, issues. And overall, we achieve um, uh, uh, an improved scale scalability to a uh, system to 32 states, uh, which is actually on that uh, uh, unlinked pendulum on a car uh, um, example that I showed earlier. On smaller problems where um, you know, a baseline is available for comparison, we achieve two to three orders of faster computation on the SDP. And uh, all the while, uh, we achieve uh, less conservative results uh, along the way. Um, so as promised, the most exciting result is on the uh, multi, sorry, multi rigid body system. But let me try to uh, pass through the main idea uh, using polynomials. So again, this uh, uh, Vanderpool oscillator to illustrate some of the overheads that's uh, um, inherent in the formulation. So we already see that uh, uh, that uh, equation one here uh, sort of uh, hinted uh, from earlier slide that we can uh, search for a um, level set of a Lyapunov function to approximate the region of attraction. And the traditional interpretation for it is pretty straightforward. We want uh, the V dot to be negative when V is within this sublevel set, when V is within the row sublevel set. And we just write out this in inequality implication directly, right? Um, so as you can see, okay, uh, I can fix a row. I can sort of check oh, what are the states that's within this row level set. And then as I grow this row, I check whether or not those states actually, actually satisfy the V dot uh, negative condition. And I call this formulation IE because it's inequality uh, uh, constrained uh, formulation. So what we prove instead is an alternative interpretation. Um, uh, it might take a, a little while to read, but let me just try to show you the high-level proof idea using this animation. So um, instead of doing inequality uh, 
inequality constrained uh, implied situation, we can sort of do the flip side. Uh, the inequality uh, constrained um, formulation uh, start with the V condition and checks the V dot. But if we can sort of uh, satisfy this uh, very mild assumption that the Hessian of the V dot is negative definite at the origin, uh, then we know the origin would be sufficiently the uh, local maximum for the V dot um, landscape. And as we move further away from the origin, as you can see from the animation, I'm moving along the V dot uh, landscape. My V dot value, because the origin is the local maximum, uh, the V dot value as I move away must first decrease. So it will become more negative, <coughs> sorry. So it will become negative at first. And eventually it will become positive because we're dealing with the local st stability here. And because um, V and F are both uh, polynomials, I know V dot must be a smooth function. So between this negative and positive uh, sort of a transition, zero crossing must have happened at some place. And that zero crossing is um, uh, sort of visualized using this yellow line. So once we have this yellow line, <clears throat> we know everything, every state that's sort of in, uh, uh, enclosed within this yellow line would already have this desired V dot negative uh, condition. And then we can do the flip side and check, oh, so now I grow the V value um, uh, level set and check whether or not um, I am enclosed within this uh, yellow line. And if I sort of uh, um, am staying within uh, the first time I touch this uh, yellow crossing, yellow zero crossing, then I know that that state is also having a desired um, negative uh, V dot and anything that's sort of under this uh, row sublevel set and that's connected, um, including the, the origin is gonna be my uh, region of attraction approximation. <clears throat> so that leads to this equality constraint formulation. I'm writing out the right-hand side explicitly uh, just so uh, it's easier to refer to it uh, in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, okay. So now we have this two uh, sort of the equality constraint formulation uh, compared with the inequality constraint uh, formulation. Why bother with that? So it serves not only as a um, sort of a intermediate um, um, uh, improvement where we eliminated the very expensive SAS constraint on the uh, lambda multi multiplier, but it also actually serves as a stepping stone for the titled uh, quotient ring uh, formulation. So quotient ring sauce programs is just a term. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, the only thing you, uh, you sort of need to understand the transition is that, uh, first of all, the quotient, quotient ring uh, formulation uh, noted as, as Q here is eventually based on the same high level in equality constraint implication. And the, the other thing is uh, there's this uh, terminology of variety uh, without sort of a uh, formally define it, just understand variety as a set of roots for polynomial equations. And so with that uh, background setup, uh, you can sort of see the similarity between the two. After all, uh, they are derived from the high level, the same high level implication. But there are certain things that make formulation Q strictly better than E in every possible way. So there are four things. First of all, just by without knowing anything about the technical detail, just by playing sort of a, a spot the difference at the picture. Um, what are the changes that's uh, sort of happened uh, along this transition? First of all, Q does not have this multiplier at all. It does not have this lambda times V dot term. So that would bring down the uh, fixed degree, the, the needed fixed degree uh, in Q. Um, the third and fourth uh, are sort of facts um, that would require some background in algebraic geometry. But um, let me just uh, say that uh, by going through the formulation Q, we can deal with Grobner basis and Grobner basis are known to be lower dimensional than the standard basis denoted as M in the equality constraint formulation. And the fourth fact is where we get our less conservative results from because equality constraint formulation depends on the degree bounded multipliers. It's a known fact that those would bring in some conservative uh, conservatism, whereas quotient ring um, programs would just directly sort of um, is equivalent to the to the to the um, to the con to the implication uh, being true. 
Um, so the only issue is that, uh, as Russ sort of uh, hinted, finding Grobner basis can be a very challenging problem, especially if your uh, system is, uh, is, is large as we are dealing with here. So with, that is where the sampling a variety approach comes in. Um, the sampling uh, variety approach says, okay, so I have now this baseline Q. Instead of solving this Q um, using the, for example, Grobner basis methods, let's just sample a bunch of points on the variety. Recall that uh, things on the variety is just the roots. So I would just sample a bunch of roots and solve a, the, the left-hand side uh, sort of um, equality constraint on those samples. So an immediate question would arise from any sampling-based method, which is when you solve problems on samples, there's usually a gap in terms of uh, correctness. And also, what are the sample complexity? How many samples do you need? So the, that's the, what I think is really uh, sort of a nice about this result. Uh, not only does it uh, provide a way to, to sort of theoretically guarantee the two uh, formulations are equivalent, but it also can do so in finite, uh, using just finite random samples. So uh, before I uh, talk to uh, talk right. about uh, sort of the, the benefits- uh, can, uh, can I ask a question? Using this method, what equivalently is happening is that uh -huh. uh, from uh, the inequality constraint condition, which is all the states within the yellow line, to the equality and quotient ring uh, result, which is all the states on the yellow line, now we only need to worry about conditions on those blue dotted uh, sort of random samples on the on the yellow line. So there's a I, lot of progression. Oh, can I ask a question? You yes, Sasha. Uh, Should I stop? I was trying to ask a question. Is it possible or? Anne cannot hear us. I texted her oh. saying Sasha was trying. Can you hear? Oh yes, now I see. Okay, sorry, I may, <laughs> may have muted. Okay, uh, can I ask a question about the previous slide just to clarify things? Sure. So the previous, in the previous slide, it looks like you are not optimizing V. You're only kind of verifying a particular V. Oh, yes, yes, yes. This is a, this is a detail that I, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention. Yes, uh, this is indeed for a fixed V. So we are only just optimizing for the level set. Yeah, okay. I just would point out that this is a little bit unfair because people go to the lengths of doing uh, the Q approach because they typically want to optimize V as well. Uh, uh, well, not Q, but actually before, okay, okay not the Q. Oh, but oh, oh, oh. The people use multipliers, I guess, because they want to uh, optimize V as well. So you are just verifying a particular V. Okay, I just want to clarify this. So you agree. So yes, you are yes. actually checking the particular V is a certificate, right? Let me say, say it back to you. Yes, I agree that this is just checking the V condition, but I think this is indeed a fair comparison because all the formulations that I presented so far within this talk are all just checking uh, for a fixed V. So uh, for example, the, if we go back to the inequality one and equality one, uh, there's no optimization over a V condition either. Uh, okay, uh, but... Yes, I agree. There are other formulations that's based on multiplier and also actually uh, have this uh, increased uh, sort of capability of optimizing over V. Uh, we are not dealing with that, but we are also okay. not comparing against those methods. Okay, thank you. Uh, no problem. And just as a plug, um, I probably won't talk about this, but there's an upcoming work that actually is, is about how to efficiently find a high quality V. Uh, okay, so... Uh, where am I? Uh, okay, so uh, the implication of using sampling variety approach on this problem is really, we only need to check conditions for these random samples. So how do we, uh, uh, how, not we, uh, Diego and, and Pablo, uh, how did they sort of guarantee the correctness, uh, which is, that's, that's really sort of at a high level, um, uh, very similar to polynomial interpolation. Right, so intuitively we can sort of see how you can correctly, faithfully recover a polynomial by just checking on the sample values um, at a finite uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, positions. And um, the two ways, uh, there are two ways of matching polynomials. Uh, the traditional way is matching the coefficients. So you expand the left-hand side uh, to compare them uh, term by term, you get uh, the 
uh, the correct A value. And you can also sort of check, okay, so in this case, I checked the evaluation at x equals one. What are uh, the value of A that can match those uh, two polynomials? Um, and I can also get the same answer. So this is the paradigm shift that's sort of um, at the most uh, sort of intuitive level that's uh, providing the correctness guarantee. Uh, but uh, as already sort of uh, uh, clear from this example, there's issues with, for example, the numbers of samples, the quality of samples. In this case, if we had sampled from x equals zero, it's gonna be useless. It doesn't give us anything for the A evaluation. And so the sampling variety uh, algorithm, step-by-step uh, -step provides a way to sort of uh, uh, efficiently solve for the problem, but also at step four, there's a way that you can check the correctness very cheaply by just checking a rank condition. And uh, I'm on, I won't have time to talk about this, but the eventual uh, SDP that's constructed is, is gonna have a low rank structure. And it's important to uh, remember it's the low rank data instead of low rank solution. So low rank data is the good case, the low rank solution is the bad case. Um, so not bad, but um, more challenging to solve. Um, so to recap, um, we sort of uh, presented four formulations already, uh, just to keep track of everything. The traditional one, the inequality uh, constrained one, uh, equality constrained one, quotient ring, and then the final uh, sort of all together using uh, sampling approach to solve the whole thing. Uh, in terms of the final SDP complexity, uh, the sampling variety one, uh, is the lowest, uh, whereas the solution quality is exactly guaranteed to be uh, the same as the quotient ring one, but better than all the other, the other two. So shown on uh, polynomial examples, um, uh, we observe um, uh, through this benchmark tests, not only an improved speed, but also, for example, the rightmost case uh, is a Pendulo bot and uh, using older uh, method, we can only find the yellow sort of uh, uh, region of attraction approximation using the multiplier-based method, whereas using the sampling-based method, we find quite tight approximation. The middle one uh, is a little sort of hard to explain, uh, but let me, let me just refer you to the paper to see the middle one is a carefully crafted, numerically challenging situation. So from the polynomial result, we see an improving speed but how do we improve the scale uh, for the promised uh, multi-rigid body system? But as Russ mentioned, um, a big chunk of the challenge, not only from the downstream verification, but sort of from, the, from the, the law of the physics, it's already a challenging problem to solve for uh, multi-rigid body dynamics because the equation of motion gives us uh, this uh, sort of a, a rational trigonom trigonometric uh, dynamics. And um, you need to invert the mass matrix in the middle, which has also sort of sines and uh, sines and cosines in them. And to invert the matrix, you would have to see, well, the growth of the matrix, the complexity of the growth is really rapidly. From one link to three link, you already see this big sort of difference. And uh, inverting it symbolically has serious scale limitation. So how do we deal with this type of very challenging dynamics uh, class instead of uh, just a simple scale. So uh, existing ways usually either sort of do Taylor approximation, which in itself also has a scalability issue, or they do a sort of clever uh, clear the denominator uh, trick, which again brings in uh, multipliers. So the way that we propose is instead of thinking of the explicit dynamics, instead of dealing with the inversion, just don't invert. Just don't 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 do the do the inversion in the first place. Uh, move the M uh, mass matrix invert to the left hand side. So now at least you have this sort of product term. Then uh, it's a it's just algebra to sort of uh, turn the whole thing into um, a polynomial form. So you first do a substitution, very standard, bringing a unit circle condition, um, and then. Um, by sort of uh, that substitution, you now have this uh, polynomial uh, equation of motion. And then the unit circle itself is also a polynomial, polynomial condition. Uh, then the rest is really just to sort of clear the, um, the, the gap. Uh, you have to transform everything into the co new coordinate, the dynamics, as well as 
the new uh, Lyapunov condition. So the bottom line is through this sort of algebra, major uh, sort of view shift uh, from uh, ordinary differential equation to uh, differential algebraic, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, to differential algebraic uh, equations, we uh, turned the whole sort of analysis into uh, three equality constraints. And we can just do the same thing as we did earlier, uh, turn the equality constraints into um, sort of a, a, a component in the variety and then do the same sampling uh, process um, as usual. And so shown here is uh, sort of the, the uh, highlight of the numerical result. And also at the bottom, I think it's easier to sort of pass through the, the uh, computational improvement. Whereas the multiplier-based method, uh, we plot out the orange, as, as in orange, their uh, PSD matrix size, the number of equality constraints, and the number of scale, scalar of variables, uh, hours, is much lower because um, the, the later two plots are actually in log scale. Oh. <clears throat> okay, cool. So contributions for this part um, is really just a re re reiteration. Uh, we sort of filled in the gap of uh, sort of addressing the formulation related over uh, head and we applied this uh, very amazing sort of numerically superior uh, finite sampling method to uh, the computational part and we achieved some um, uh, computational uh, improvement. The next part, uh, analyzing neural network controllers. Uh, so I, I don't think I need to actually motivate this part. Um, maybe a lot of you came to the talk because of this part. Um, so even politicians are talking about machine learning nowadays. So it's really, really trending. Uh, and it's also, it's trending a lot of areas and also in control, uh, particularly in terms of like reinforcement learning, doing, doing those uh, super, or supervised learning even uh, for control tasks. What ensues is that similar to the original motivation, uh, the need of safety guarantee, the need of verification. Um, if you take a look at, you know, uh, the, the, fast, the past five years of NURI uh, project topics, um, it's, it's mentioned multiple times sometimes uh, over, for one year and every year there's gonna be some variations of topics that's basically talking about the same thing. How do we verify a system with learning components in them? How do we um, sort of safely guarantee that, okay, uh, you know, there's a, a learned components uh, or how do we uh, sort of bridge the two uh, fundamentally sort of different methods, the, the optimization, the control and learning together. And uh, I want to especially point out uh, this year, uh, the last picture here, the, the bottom picture of topic eight, it's almost exactly captures the core idea of this part of the talk. How do we sort of shift, combine, uh, uh, sort of use ideas from uh, dynamic control theory to sort of uh, guarantee safeness of uh, learning, learning or learned systems. Um, so safety is such a big concern uh, in because if, if, if we sort of can measure the importance of an issue by uh, dollar values, it's like one of the, one of the pressing ones there. Um, it's such a big concern, particularly because um, in learning context, um, your networks are known to be very brittle. So this is the landscape of an input-output relationship of a neural network. Looks innocent enough until you look closely. Uh, locally, there's like pitfalls everywhere. So such sort of very um, uh, sort of weird or very um, unsmooth uh, local geometry has led to uh, the well-known adversarial examples. Uh, sticks, a stick uh, posted to the stop sign and the neural network somehow thinks that this is a 45 mile per hour um, sign. And um, that sort of adversarial example has motivated a lot of work in robustness analysis. Right. Uh, so, for example, using uh, convex uh, relaxation to try to say something about, you know, um, a, a, an LP ball around a pixel, um, any sort of a, a variation in that LP ball, once passing through that neural network, I would still get the same um, classification. So that's sort of a safety guarantee. Uh, in our own group, we've also sort of uh, studied the, the same situation instead of using mixed integer programming. So to trade off uh, uh, sort of concertism with um, uh, the cost of the computation. And even myself, uh, through collaboration with uh, Sadra and, um, and Osbert, have done some work on basically uh, 
translating the same sort of high level idea on uh, feed forward neural network control systems. So uh, a big gap there is really uh, all of those work, all of those talks are all about feed forward neural networks and none of them about recurrent neural networks. Um, so why do we care about recurrent neural networks, especially in the context of control and, um, and uh, robotics? So uh, for example, think of yourself as an as a robot uh, and controlled by a feed forward neural network and you're the guy on the left. Uh, I feed you this image and I wanted you to decide where, what's your next move, uh, what, what your next move should be. But it's very hard to decide because not only do I not know um, where the, the puck is gonna be, um, uh, I cannot make the prediction, I cannot make a very informed decision, I cannot even know if I played last, so I cannot even know if it's my turn to play. And that's all because uh, the sort of the concept of partially observable ability. So in this case, I need this sequential information uh, to make a sort of the subsequent um, control uh, actions. And those sort of partially observable, um, um, partially observable systems usually in the classical control um, context are solved by dynamic output feedback controllers. And in the learning context, it's exactly RN with a sort of a cell here. Uh, this is just representing one cell and one step. I will talk about the dynamics of it in a little bit, but I want to bring it to your attention, uh, which may have been sort of overlooked, which is RNs are uh, suffering from the same adversarial attacks. Um, or for example, a waveform uh, translation, which is the typical application in the learning community for RNs. Uh, I can also add some noise to target lead, uh, sort of uh, um, manipulate the outcome of the of the prediction. Uh, some audio coming up. Uh, uh, if if you if you have the volume up, uh, pay attention. Um, so, for example, let's play some Bach. Uh, this is the um, original audio. This is the so-called adversarial uh, uh, example. Um, so so uh, by playing the second uh, audio form, uh, it actually recognized that as a speech can be embedded in music. And you probably cannot hear the difference between the two, uh, maybe because uh, of, the, of the sound system here, but it's also because I played it actually backwards. So the first one I played is actually the adversarial one. So it's really hard to tell the difference in that in that sense. And the same situation uh, can happen in like text translation. Uh, this is the sort of innocent enough uh, translation. Whereas almost sound exactly the same, but it's doing evil things. It's asking to go to do harm. So. So I, I think, I hope that I, I sort of uh, um, motivated enough that it's of great importance that we understand RN not only by itself, but also in a feedback loop, uh, in a sort of a control system, how does it affect our um, sort of overall performance. Um, so now let's uh, get to the details of the RN setup. Uh, so RNs are usually sort of represented here as a, a sort of a cell unit. Uh, with some memory cells, with some state cells, uh, those cells are going to be responsible for keeping those sort of sequential contexts that we talked about in the uh, air hockey uh, example. So here, uh, if we just look at it as a dynamic system, uh, the H is going to be the state, um, and uh, uh, H plus is going to be the next uh, cell state. Um, the the uh, the sort of target sign. Uh, how to cut it. uh, it's the element wise multiplication and the thing that we train for are the weights inside those tench functions um, and uh, I differentiate tench C and tench F because um, they use different set of weights so why is RN so hard to analyze uh, why is there sort of effectively no work on verifying RN um, when there are so many uh, uh, sort of different uh, attempts at verifying feed forward networks so I think fundamentally there are two uh, major challenges. One is that uh, it doesn't use ReLU as the activation function uh, in the layers. Um, so whereas ReLU, um, the relaxation or analysis is relatively more straightforward where you can do linear uh, program or you can do a uh, mixed integer uh, program. Uh, in RNs, the sort of uh, uh, a prevailing uh, activation is hyperbolic tangent. And it takes some sort of cleverness to actually 
analyze that sort of nonlinearity. The subtle, the subtle difficulty is really uh, in feed forward neural networks, everything is static. You put something in, you get something out. Push an LP ball in, you get an LP ball out. But for RN uh, verification, if you to, were to follow the same philosophy, you would have to unroll the, uh, the entire chain. And that gets very complicated very fast because you have to push the ball through um, at each time. And that either sort of brings in more computational burden or to really shrinks down your ball very uh, quickly. So what we propose is a novel relaxation of the tension on linearity, and we use control theory to just automatically get rid of the time dependence uh, sort of difficulty. Um, so the thing we propose is, bu uh, is built on um, IQC, uh, the framework that uh, uh, um, Sasha sort of uh, uh, pioneered. Um, in the standard IQC, the whole idea is, uh, is uh, sort of you can bound nonlinearities as Tench, such as tench with this uh, quadratic constraint. So this butterfly-shaped uh, area can actually be described by a quadratic inequality. And similarly, you can uh, have this uh, so-called saturation sector condition to bound it in a different way. So what we sort of found out and what we came in is that we find out, oh, shifted version of the sector conditions are also valid IQCs for um, these uh, nonlinearities. Uh, but, but still, those, those, those sort of uh, four relaxations all look very uh, relaxed, very loose. So the nice thing about IQC is you can put them in conjunction. So in this case, if you put all four IQCs in conjunction, you actually get something like the one shown on the top here, much tighter. And additionally, we are also sort of um, um, uh, taking advantage of the fact that this uh, slope is also um, this tent function is also slope bounded so that we also proposed a new IQC. So taking uh, into account of the integral part of it. So uh, the, quickly showing the result, uh, we were able to verify. Uh, so for example, here, a double integrator, which would be a nice sort of uh, representer of the puck uh, situation there. Um, we would be able to uh, use the RN to uh, verify that. Uh, if my uh, puck studied from this region, I will be able to uh, formally say that it's going to be stable. Um, another set of uh, experiment that we did is, uh, well, we know RN is very good at encoding sequential uh, relationships. So how about we train an RN to approximate an unknown and uh, partially observable system and then try to analyze it more formally and then use that idea on um, the Vanderpool benchmark. Um, we first started with some uh, short history to initialize the, the network and then get very good approximation uh, error and also sort of by the very tight approximation techniques, we get also very tight um, region of attraction uh, sort of approximation. So I wanna uh, end this part by saying uh, uh, a few words about the contribution. Um, because it's, as far as we know, actually the first formal analysis of RN controlled systems. Uh, we sort of presented this idea uh, publicly uh, almost two years ago uh, over the summer of 2018. And um, at the time, we didn't actually end up writing a paper about it because at the time, a big question we got asked is really what's the scalability that you guys can solve? So for example, in the vendor pro example I showed earlier, it's solving a one layered uh, recurrent neural network with 10 units. So we thought it's not that useful, so we didn't actually submit the paper, but as it turned out, it's actually of comparable scalability uh, of some of the most recent uh, recently a sort of a, a available um, uh, work. And so with that and uh, our new sampling a variety uh, approach, we think uh, the scalability is much more sort of a, um, less of a concern now. And we have hope that we can sort of improve that uh, further. And uh, another more subtle uh, contribution I want to highlight is that the proposed IQC is sort of more generally applicable to not only tench nonlinearities, but anything that's uh, sort of value bounded and slope bounded. Um, let me skip. Uh, I actually prepared for the new one, but let me just, I think I'm going almost over time. Let me just quickly say uh, a few uh, acknowledgement. Uh, 
uh, of course, first and foremost, uh, thanks to Russ for his support and guidance and everything um, for his uh, technical inputs and sort of philosophical guidance. Um, I also wanted to point out that Russ is so sort of his work ethics and uh, discipline and uh, open-mindedness is, is, I think, uh, it's going to be a lifelong uh, inspiration. I also want to thank Pablo and Sasha. You you probably already see uh, the lineage of, of their work to mine. Uh, I also want to say um, um, over the past two years we had uh, bi-weekly meetings and uh, I learned so much from the two of them but I also think uh, they together with Russ uh, are interested in sort of the same similar problems but they have a very balanced taste and to be able to directly benefit from those I think is a is a is a rare uh, privilege even at a place at MIT, like MIT. Um, I want to thank all the uh, local robot locomotion group members. Um, in particular, I want to call out Hong Kai, uh, Twine and Robin, who really helped me uh, sort of uh, getting to know the, the lab better, answered a lot of my stupid questions at the beginning of the, of the PhD uh, uh, journey. Um, so, and all the other current members who sort of makes the, the lab so stimulating and collaborative. Uh, a bunch of people that's hard to classify, uh, Diego for his uh, help uh, in understanding the sampling variety approach, Sadra and Osbert for the collaboration on the verification of feed-forward neural network controlled system, Mika for uh, a lot of the talks on transferring the, the techniques to uh, the, uh, the hardware platform at Lincoln Lab, and also uh, Alexandra Maudry uh, for initiating the CDML um, uh, sort of weekly seminar, which taught me so much about learning theory that I don't have the uh, time to present it here. Um, a special thanks goes to Asu. Um, um, it's not really technical, but rather um, my PhD journey is sort of bumpy in the beginning when I transitioned from master's to PhD. There's a few years where I was really lost in, and uh, Asu really was generous with her time and experience and encouraged and guided me back to the right track. Um, and then leads to uh, Andrew Lippmann, who's my uh, master's advisor over at the Media Lab. Um, also not really technical because the projects are very different, but I think he really sort of from a very early time taught me the importance of um, making an argument, making a sale, uh, which I'm still learning, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's important to acknowledge that he taught me the importance of that. Uh, I want to thank Hui Jun Gao and Li Xian Zhang from my undergrad years for providing me uh, the opportunity, the, my first research opportunity, and Ye Zhao for leading the project that later turned into my first paper. Uh, for my uh, thanks, thanks to my friends uh, for putting up with my uh, shenanigans, um, and uh, especially for laughing at my uh, stupid jokes. Uh, thanks to my mom and dad. Uh, my mom is just awesome, uh, supportive, uh, independent, and uh, caring. Uh, my dad actually, unfortunately, uh, passed away almost uh, exactly 10 years ago in a car accident. Um, so uh, I do wish he was uh, alive to sort of share this journey and this moment. Uh, but uh, I like to think he knew already I would have enjoyed what I experienced here uh, at MIT because he's the one sort of sparked the dream in engineering in the first place. Uh, and also, finally, uh, thanks to all the funding agencies for the money. Thank you. Very virtual clapping. Sean, that was awesome. Thank you for that and for the nice closing. So um, I think the way that we MC this now is that anybody who's here can ask questions. And then afterwards, we'll have a closed session with the committee and any other faculty that want to join. And unfortunately, we don't get to do the normal, say, come, come find us in the lab to celebrate and have cake uh, this time. But um, I will leave this open and anybody who, like I'll post it on the lab channels and stuff and anybody who wants to come back and congratulate Shen after I post and tell you to come back, uh, we, can, we can give her our, our best thoughts, uh, assuming we get to that point. I don't want, um, so, okay. So anybody else, anybody who has questions? Uh, I might have one, Shen. Hi, Tobia. Hey, thank you for the very nice talk. So uh, I don't know much about the you know recurrent neural networks and LSTMs and things like that. Yeah. 
but in, in from what I hear you saying and other guys saying is like the the architecture there seems to be kind of uh, arbitrary and not very well reasoned. Maybe it's more like empirical guided kind of thing. Do you think that uh, you know uh, the verification part can have a role in uh, understanding what are you know the best uh, architectures for these kind of networks? Maybe. Uh, at the price of you know changing a small change in the architecture you get uh, a big increase in scalability of your techniques or things like that that's a, a pretty good question so uh, let me sort of uh, address that in two parts the first is uh, the arbitrary part I to some extent agree I think yes uh, there's been variations of proposals on sort of simplify or sort of modify the LSTM networks uh, to achieve a comparable performance um, but I think uh, the underlying gated idea is still uh, sort of at least uh, that's that's true across those variations. So I think there at least is um, um, maybe not theoretically justified, but uh, at least empirically and uh, intuitively, um, those are sort of nice ideas to have across the across the different designs. Um, understanding uh, well. Let me actually answer that by three parts. So you asked uh, about the arbitrariness of the of the architecture, whether or not verifying the 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 network itself is 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 of value is of any value if you believe the archetypes are going to change. On that part, I also somewhat agree. I think uh, there are some more fundamental questions that we need to address uh, that's not really captured by any of those current. Uh, sort of neural network verification framework. Uh, for example, um, uh, a lot of those are uh, based on just around a simple, uh, around a single sample point, instead of saying something about the distribution of the data. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of it is also a sort of based on LP balls and the, the metricness is also uh, a big discussion in that area. But uh, I do think uh, understanding those, dare I say, let me, yeah, maybe ad hoc uh, verification uh, at the surface. I do think there's hope in bringing some understanding in sort of improve the architecture, improving the the parameters. There's this notion of robust training already uh, surfing, uh, um, sort of uh, how you can uh, sort of adversarially train your network such that uh, uh, in the in the hope of being more. Uh, in the hope of making the network easier to verify, you actually improve the robustness along the way. And in terms of the uh, architecture search, uh, I'm actually not aware of uh, whether there's work on sort of starting from a verification point of view that helps you to do the, uh, to the, to do the uh, uh, architecture search. I do want to point out that uh, there's a lot of sort of um, theoretical machine learning um, uh, progress on learning sort of more of a uh, independent indispensable uh, ingredients in, in in machine learning at, at large for example uh, stochastic gradient descent batch normalization um, uh, regularization those things holds true across all uh, sort of architecture application or hyperparameters so uh, and and also the the more recent over parameterization idea so I do think uh, there might be some work to be done uh, to, to sort of making that connection, uh, whether or not in the process of trying to verify correctness or robustness of the network, you can learn something back and feed that back into the design process. I do think there's hope in there. Thank you. Hi, so I have a question about the verification stuff. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, it seems like the analysis you presented deals with the case when you have like an end-to-end -end learned controller, so learning the closed loop response of a system. Does the analysis, or is that correct, and does the analysis change when you have like a mixed system? So you have maybe like a traditional optimal controller that's taking estimation from like a learned object detection system. Is that a fundamentally different problem, or is there a similarity there? Um, yes, there's some similarity there. So at a high level, I think the, the similarity is really the, the type of guarantee what we want to offer. At the lower level, models are, of course, different, and that would require different uh, type of uh, sort of techniques uh, that addresses those um, different architectures or different models. I think, yes, at a high level, it's, it's quite similar. 
Oh, By the you. way, I don't know who was asking the question. Sorry, I, I can't see, so I can't thank him for the, the question. That was Charles. He's like, uh, yes. I mean, I think, and Charles, I think you brought up a good point. The, the really hard part, though, if you're going to put an object recognition system under test is not only the neural network, but the renderer that is your camera model. Mm -hmm. We don't have good ways to bound that yet. Okay, right. thank you. Last call. Uh, yeah, I, uh, this is Micah. I, I have a question for you, Shen. Oh, hi, Micah. Hi, how are you? Um, your, your discussion on uh, verification by sampling on the variety, uh, you talked about sampling points along the variety to define your semi-definite program. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on the importance, uh, how important it is to sample exactly on the variety, um, given you will probably be uh, solving for those points computationally? Yes. Um, so, of course, we want to have samples as correct as possible. I think, though, and this is just an intuition, I always try to add, get the uh, accurate samples. So I actually haven't tried uh, sort of compare, oh, this is a bunch of crappy samples. Uh, how does the quality de deteriorate? But I would guess it's probably not going to hurt that much in our particular application. Uh, because our particular application is about Lyapunov function sort of verification. And we know from experience that Lyapunov functions are not that sort of sparse. Not, they, they sort of like, oh, if you can find a Lyapunov function, a little bit nearby uh, areas are also going to be uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, um, disturb the Lyapunov function a little bit. It's oftentimes still a valid Lyapunov function. And so I think uh, from that intuition to uh, to the sampling, which is really just the derivative of the Lyapunov function, that's the variety, I think maybe uh, intuitively getting a little bit off would just land you to another valid Lyapunov uh, derivative uh, variety. That's just my guess. But, uh, but there, are, uh, there are actually uh, sort of a very good uh, uh, software out there that can help you uh, it, it iteratively improve the sampling uh, quality. Uh, you can uh, so so you can start with some sort of pretty crappy, but already uh, it's contradicting. Uh, you can start with some uh, close uh, samples, not really exactly precise, but iteratively using a variance of Newton method, you can improve the quality later on and further and further. Mm. If you are willing to pay the price, of course. Okay. Um... I, I, I still I still wonder if uh, how much concern needs to be made in uh, oh in the correct preserving the right, preser right. yes preserving the right, correctness right, right. okay yes yes result. thanks thanks for for the follow up yes yeah. uh, actually there's yes so uh, that was uh, my uh, intuitive answer which is what if it really happens um, what's the implication but uh, uh, in the sampling variety work there's actually uh, a way to sort of deal with this numerical issue, this sort of numerical uh, discrepancy. Uh, once you once you uh, done the, the, the analysis, once you check the sampling are uh, generic enough and you can solve the problem, you can again do a sanity check, you can sample again, and that would uh, sort of gives you another sort of layer of uh, numerical guarantee that mm, this is, even though it's a crappy sample, maybe numerical, within numerical tolerance, it's still uh, numerically correct. So there's another sanity check step that you can sort of rely on. Okay, great. Um, I'll, I'll check that out. Thanks, Shen. Oh, no problem. Thanks. Okay, I recommend that we thank Shen again and then move on to the closed session. So good job, Shen. Oh, thank you. So anybody, everybody who's on the committee has to stay. Anybody who's on the faculty may stay. And I will send out a note, um, like I said, to the channel, to the obvious channels at least, uh, once the deliberations are done and leave the same Zoom link open. <laughs>